where parties that was, if you ask me, what's a freak party? A freak party is a party that's held at Hugh Hefner's house. Bingo. That everybody was wanting to go to. It was called pig night, but we as butlers were always told, do not call them pigs. This was Hefner's term for them. And I've been saying this for the longest, that the powdered donuts, the alcohol, the fountains of alcohol, the punches, the spikes, all that stuff goes back in Hollywood for decades. Mark Curry has finally spoken up about the extent to which Diddy's freaky parties would go and how it was all allegedly connected to the Playboy freaky parties. In his video, Curry began by questioning the reluctance of individuals to speak out against injustices or misconduct within the industry. He attributed this hesitance to a fear of being different, of stepping outside the established norms, and a constant drive to compete and outdo others. He emphasized the importance of courage in speaking up, rather than succumbing to societal pressures to remain silent. The conversation took an intriguing turn when Curry touched upon the legacy of Hugh Hefner and his infamous parties. Please. Where parties that was, if you ask me, what's a freak party? A freak party is a party that's held at Hugh Hefner's house. Bingo. That everybody was wanting to go to. So how is all this connected to Diddy? Well, in the mid 2010s, some rumors were making rounds on the corners of the grapevine that Diddy had underground tunnels that led to and from the Playboy Mansion. The rumors began when Diddy purchased a mansion valued at $40 million in 2014 in the same neighborhood as the Playboy Mansion. According to unconfirmed sources, the tunnels were made so that Diddy could move effortlessly to the mansion without figuring out how to escape the prying eyes of the paparazzi. However, it all remained a rumor as no one had actually come forward to confirm seeing or using the purported tunnels. You see, Playboy had a strict policy when it came to mansion invites. Rob Lowe was among the guests and revealed that he wasn't allowed to bring any friends with him. Luke Wilson learned all about this hard way. Luke decided to sneak in a friend at the mansion and played it off that it was his brother Owen. Once the mansion security realized it wasn't, Wilson was kicked out of the mansion and temporarily banned. Wilson recalls, I got DNA ed from the Playboy Mansion in Los Angeles. That means do not admit. That's their special word. I tried to get a friend in and I'd shown up and they said, who are you with? And I'm like, I'm with my brother Owen. And they're like, we need to see him. It was actually my friend Eckelman, who doesn't look anything like Owen. I was not allowed to go there for a year and a half. I had to make kind of a tearful phone call to Mary, the woman who kind of runs the operation. I said, Mary, what I did was stupid. It was wrong. Hef's Hugh Hefner been so generous to me. I actually did, I think, cry on the telephone. The late Hugh Hefner was very selective with who he invited the parties, and as it turns out, he also extended himself for certain A-list celebrities. It is an urban legend that in the 70s, Playboy created tunnels to sneak A-listers into the mansion. According to the Playboy website, the tunnel did exist, and there are blueprints showing the tunnels and where they lead to. Playboy writes, so according this blueprint, tunnels were built to the homes of Mr. J. Nicholson, Mr. W. Beatty, Mr. K. Douglas, and Mr. J. Kahn. We'll go ahead and assume they're talking about Jack Nicholson, Warren Beatty, Kirk Douglas, and James Kahn, all of whom lived near the Playboy Mansion during the late 1970s and early 1980s. There are no dates on the architectural schematics, but the dates on the Polaroids were from 1977. It is said that Playboy kept very quiet about the tunnels and didn't intend on speaking further about it. In any case, some of the people who managed to witness what happened in the mansion were able to describe what Hugh termed as pig nights. According to his employees, the editor-in-chief held the bash on Thursday nights. However, they would look the other way while Hefner did all sorts of crazy stuff. Guys on the mansion list were expected to bring women. They were ranked. There was a hierarchy of whether you were a 10 or an 8 or a 6. A source told TMZ that Hefner would sit at the head of the table while the models hung out with various film and TV stars. They also explained that the girls would get medical checks before any activities took place. Where the doctor would inspect them for anything that would uh, be detrimental to any of his friends. It was called pig night, but we as butlers were always told, do not call them pigs. This was Hefner's term for them. Pig night would start as a dinner party and quickly descend into S parties. 
Meanwhile, over the years, multiple playmates have spoken out about their lives in the world's most famous bachelor pad, making it pretty clear it wasn't all fun in S games. Those that used to live at the world-famous address have told of catfights between rival models, strict lockdown rules, and bizarre and degrading S rituals. Holly Madison offered a bleak picture of her time in her book, Down the Rabbit Hole, Curious Adventures and Cautionary Tales of a Former Playboy Bunny. Everyone thinks that the infamous metal gate was meant to keep people out, but I grew to feel it was meant to lock me in," she wrote. She also claimed Hefner, who died age 91 in 2017, would watch pee, smoke weed, and please himself while his girlfriends would cavort in front of him after being ordered to dress in identical nightwear. Holly also revealed romps with the Playboy King were certainly not something to write home about. She said, there was zero intimacy involved, no kissing, nothing. It was so brief that I can't even recall what it felt like beyond having a heavy body on top of mine. Holly revealed there was a lot of jealousy in the mansion, made worse when she got the coveted position of number one girlfriend. She explained, suddenly, playmates who had once mocked me were kissing my ass, bringing me gifts and showering me with compliments now that I was Hef's number one girlfriend. Former bunny Kendra Wilkinson revealed that she slept with Hefner when she was 18 and he was 78. Writing in her book, Being Kendra, Cribs, Cocktails, and Getting My Sexy Back, she said, I had to be very drunk or smoke lots of weed to survive those nights. There was no way around it. At about the minute mark, I pulled away and it was done. It was like a job, clock in, clock out. It's not like I enjoyed having S with him. Kendra also revealed how Hef once targeted her over her appearance saying, we were all in the limo on the way to a book signing with Hef when he pulled me aside. Is everything okay? He asked. I feel fat, Hef, I told him. Everyone is so pretty. It's making me really insecure. Well, you look a little bigger, he said honestly. Maybe you can go to the gym. Fellow playmate Isabella St. James claimed in her autobiography that her experience at the mansion wasn't as pleasant as outsiders may be led to believe. In Bunny Tales, behind closed doors at the Playboy Mansion, she explained that the girls would get their $1,000 allowance from Hefner himself every Friday. She writes, We had to go to Hef's room, wait while he picked up all the dog poo off the carpet, and then ask for our allowance. We all hated this process. Hef would always use the occasion to bring up anything he wasn't happy about in the relationship. Most of the complaints were about the lack of harmony among the girlfriends, or your lack of participation in the parties he held in his bedroom. If we'd been out of town for any reason and missed one of the official going out nights he wouldn't want to give us the allowance. He used it as a weapon. Playboy model Carla Howe previously told how the girls had a strict 9 p.m. curfew, saying that none of them were even allowed to invite friends to the mansion to see them. But everyone, it's their dream to go to that type of party in their lifetime, so it's amazing that I've actually got to experience and live that to the full. She told The Sun the house was more like an old people's home than a haven for wild. The British beauty said he almost never leaves home and refuses to change anything in the mansion, so the whole place feels like it's stuck in the 1980s. There is no velvet or gold and all the carpets are brown and curling. And Carla's twin, Melissa, added that there were strict rules all the women have to follow while they're living in the 22-bedroom mansion. She said, if you do something wrong, you'll get an email. There's a strict code of conduct. There are even rules about Instagram and Twitter. You've got to show everything in a good light, and if you're drunk in a picture, you'll be in trouble. While the Playboy bunnies could enjoy nights on the town at Hefner's expense, the live-in girlfriends didn't have much freedom, Kendra claimed. She said she had to be at home every night by 9 p.m., which made her feel trapped. Nights were hard because while my playmate friends got to go out and party, I would have to be home by 9 p.m., Kendra said. I'd get a text message from a girl that read, having so much fun in Vegas, wish you were here, partying with all these football players, and that was devastating. I felt so trapped and angry when I was missing out on something good. Isabella also described dirty carpets in the mansion and the poor state of the girls' rooms in her book. She wrote, Although we all did our best to decorate our rooms and make them homey, the mattresses on our beds were disgusting, old, worn, and stained. The sheets were past their best, too. The conditions that these ladies went through while at the mansion relate a lot to what Cassie Ventura described in her lawsuit. Cassie says there was a pattern of control, drug use, and forced sexual encounters. Ventura sued under New York's Adult Survivors Act, which gave victims a one-time one-year window to sue their alleged SA perpetrator and institutions, even if the statute of limitations had run out. She says she first met Combs in 2005 when she was 19 and he was 37. 
In the lawsuit, she alleges that Combs controlled nearly every aspect of her life, from her career to having access to her personal medical records. She claims he was frequently violent, physically abing her multiple times a year, and that he often plied her with copious amounts of drugs. The complaint also claims that Combs forced Ventura to have sex with male escorts in different cities, encounters she says he watched and recorded. The singer says she never went to the police because she was afraid that doing so would merely give Mr. Combs another excuse to hurt her. She also alleges that following a dinner in 2018, Combs forced himself into her apartment and essayed her while she repeatedly said no and tried to push him away. Ventura says she ended the relationship for good afterward. In her lawsuit, she referred to multiple witnesses who saw the AB take place. One of them is her friend, singer-songwriter Tiffany Redd, who wrote an open letter to Combs describing an incident on Ventura's 29 The Edge birthday party in 2015. Ventura and Redd claim that that night, Combs and his security team forced Ventura to leave because he wanted her to have sex with other men. It was derailed. I spent years working with Cassie. Years. The music is incredible. It's all f now. Red said Ventura had disclosed to her at the time that Combs was physically abusive. I feel compelled to show up for Cassie and myself and confirm that everything she described in her complaint about what happened that night is consistent with what I experienced, she wrote. In a statement to the New York Times, Combs's lawyer Benjamin Braffman said, Combs denied the allegations and that the lawsuit was riddled with baseless and outrageous lies, aiming to tarnish Mr. Combs's reputation and seeking a payday. Ventura and Combs settled the lawsuit one day after it was filed. The details remain private. Braffman said that the settlement is in no way an admission of wrongdoing. I have decided to resolve this matter amicably on terms that I have some level of control, Ventura said in a statement. I want to thank my family, fans, and lawyers for their unwavering support. Meanwhile, Combs said, we have decided to resolve this matter amicably. I wish Cassie and her family all the best. Love. In May, CNN released security footage showing Combs a Ventura in the elevator bay at the now-closed Intercontinental Hotel in Los Angeles in 2016. The graphic video shows Combs grabbing Ventura by the head, throwing her to the ground, and repeatedly kicking her. He also shoves her into a corner and throws what appears to be a vase at her. The video appears to support a similar incident Ventura described in her suit. Combs followed her into the hallway of the hotel while yelling at her. He grabbed at her and then took glass vases in the hallway and threw them at her, causing glass to crash around them as she ran to the elevator to escape, Ventura's complaint reads. Meanwhile, Ventura's lawyer Douglas H. Wigdor told CNN, the gut-wrenching video has only further confirmed the disturbing and predatory behavior of Mr. Combs. Words cannot express the courage and fortitude that Ms. Ventura has shown in coming forward to bring this to light. After the video was made public, Combs posted an apology video on Instagram. I take full responsibility for my actions in that video. I was disgusted then when I did it. I'm disgusted now. I went and I sought out professional help. I got into going to therapy, going to rehab. I had to ask God for his mercy and grace, Combs said. I'm so sorry, but I'm committed to be a better man each and every day. I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm truly sorry. Ventura's attorney Meredith Firetog responded to the apology in a statement saying, Combs's most recent statement is more about himself than the many people he has hurt. When Cassie and multiple other women came forward, he denied everything and suggested that his victims were looking for a payday. That he was only compelled to apologize once his repeated denials were proven false shows his pathetic desperation, and no one will be swayed by his disingenuous words. In an interview with Piers Morgan, Combs's former head of security said he wasn't surprised by the footage because he witnessed the rapper being violent toward women four or five times. Roger Bonds, who worked for the mogul for a decade, alleged he had seen Combs be violent toward Cassie and his former partner Kim Porter, with whom he shares three children. Porter died in 2018 from pneumonia. Seven-year-old Porter's body found after a desperate call to 911. EMS 14, respond with engine 76 on scene of the cardiac arrest. In late May, Cassie released a statement on domestic violence, saying she was grateful for all the support she's received in the wake of the footage becoming public.
The outpouring of love has created a place for my younger self to settle and feel safe now. But this is only the beginning. DV is the issue. It broke me down to someone I never thought I would become. With a lot of hard work, I am better today, but I will always be recovering from my past, she wrote on Instagram. Thank you to everyone that has taken the time to take this matter seriously. My only ask is that everyone open your heart to believing victims the first time. It takes a lot of heart to tell the truth out of a situation that you were powerless in. I offer my hand to those that are still living in fear. Reach out to your people, don't cut them off. No one should carry this weight alone. This healing journey is never ending, but this support means everything to me. If such a man could allegedly perpetrate all these crimes and still disguise them, it is possible that there are actual tunnels leading from Diddy's house to the mansion and back. Mind you, rumors of the underground tunnels made rounds in the 1970s and 80s, but were only recently confirmed. Four actors had secret underground tunnels directly from their homes to the Playboy Mansion. So, Diddy's tunnels could exist, but it would be a matter of time before concrete evidence is brought forward. Meanwhile, many fans suspect these underground tunnels served other purposes than just connecting to the Playboy Mansion. They theorize that these tunnels could have other secret passages leading to bunkers where Diddy's freak-off parties take place. The music is famous for his wild parties, which many of his industry colleagues, including former mentees and associates, have spoken about at length. 50 Cent once insinuated that these parties were gay parties, and though he didn't have anything against gays, it was his kind of party, so he would rather not go. He told his teeming fans at his musical concert he had stopped attending Puffy's parties. One of them Puffy parties. Uh-uh. They can hug you from the front and the back at the same time. Usher also spoke about Diddy's parties when he sat in an interview with Howard Stern on the Sirius XM network. He spoke of what he saw at those parties and wondered to himself if he could indulge as a then 13-year-old. They called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> to learn Flavor some Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's going to In the 90s, do you understand what that's like? Diddy's former mentee and bad boy signee, Mark Curry, also once opened up about a Diddy party that he attended where he saw half-naked models popping pills into the mouths of the patrons. He then described how specific bottles believed to contain spiked alcohol were marked and reserved for certain people, while the average person was allowed to consume regular alcohol. Cassie Ventura told of parties where she was forced to sleep with several male streetwalkers. Then there was Rodney Jones Jr., who spoke about parties where young ladies were coerced into s acts with patrons. Now, all these people never mentioned where these parties took place, leaving room for speculation. But given the exclusivity of the intricate tunnels, it isn't far-fetched to assume that parties of that caliber would take place there. Interestingly, some sections of fans actually believe that the tunnels were the main locations for these freak-offs. They believe this is why it is becoming difficult for the feds to get evidence for such parties. In the fans' estimation, Diddy might have intricately designed the tunnels himself to ensure he had several escape routes if the feds got a tip and were closing in on them. Talking of escape routes, it is believed that Diddy used one of these tunnels to escape the long arms of the law when the feds raided his compound. The feds made a cacophony of noises when they breached Diddy's compound, which could have alerted him to their presence, allowing him to escape. Reports from news outlets suggest that the 17,000-square-foot mansion has an underwater tunnel with a speedboat fully gassed up and ready. In March, feds raided the two mansions of Diddy in Miami and LA, following several reports of illegally transporting women and men to work as streetwalkers. At least one lawsuit against the music mogul accused him of running a ring that included selling people, laundering money, and forcing themselves on women. Based on intelligence, the feds stormed the homes, but Diddy was nowhere near his residence. His two sons, Justin and King Combs, were reportedly handcuffed and questioned. This annoyed their money, who took to social media to vent her spleen on the treatment of her sons. Misa Hilton, the mother of the children, played the race card when she alleged that her children would have been handled differently if they were of a different race. She described the Fed's actions as overzealous and militarized, describing how several beams of red laser were targeted at her son's chests. Could be his son's. That could be his son's. Again, if, if that is accurate, I wouldn't be surprised because the allegations put forward in that lawsuit implicated his sons in uh, different criminal so, activities. Curiously, Diddy's sons weren't the only ones subjected to the military force exerted by Homeland Security. According to music producer Stevie J, he was sitting outside Diddy's studios when he heard a loud followed by a few helicopters hovering over the compound and several men rushing towards him. 
He recounted that these men were all armed to their teeth with rifles and defensive shields. A few seconds later, he saw several red dots on his shirt, with men shouting commands at him to get down on the floor. After he was handcuffed, he demanded to see the officer in charge, and he was obliged. What became of the meeting with the officer wasn't disclosed, but it appears it led to an amicable settlement. However, when all these events unfolded at Diddy's $40 million mansion, the music mogul was nowhere to be found. Some reports indicate that Diddy was on his way to the Miami Opa Laka Executive Airport. Many believe he was in the Miami residence when the raids took place but got away via the underwater tunnel. Others believe that he was just hiding in one of the numerous tunnels and only resurfaced when he was sure that the coast was clear. Curiously, the feds didn't appear to be on the hunt for Diddy, so it didn't make sense to evade them. Rather, they seemed to be looking for evidence to build their case against the mogul. However, singer Jaguar Wright has an interesting but different take on how the raid was carried out, and it is eye-opening. According to her, the feds somehow suspected Diddy had links in the security agencies, so they informed no one of the impending raids. She claimed that not even the men on the ground knew whose house they were going to storm until they got there. So, the raid on Diddy's home took the raiders themselves by surprise, and that's if Jaguar Wright's words are true. She explained that the officers were only informed a few hours before the incident, but they didn't know where they were going. Now here is where it all gets interesting, because Wright isn't the first person to accuse Diddy of having links in law enforcement. In Rodney Jones's suit against the music mogul, he alleged that Diddy had links in both Los Angeles and Miami. Miami law enforcement. Cassie also insinuated the same thing, which was why she didn't report Diddy to the police during their tumultuous 10-year relationship. Rodney explained that Diddy's links were facilitated and maintained by his head of security, Fahim Mohammed, who happened to head Michael Jackson's security detail before his demise. Rodney recalled that Diddy instructed his signees and mentees to call Fahim Mohammed whenever they ran into problems with law enforcement officers. In his suit against Diddy, he recounted an incident where Diddy and his son Justin allegedly broke the law, but Fahim helped them clean it up. The incident occurred at the Cheris Recording Studios in Los Angeles, where Diddy and Justin had gone to work on a project. While working, they got into a heated confrontation with another man named G. The man left for the bathroom but was still pursued by Diddy and his son. Gunshots were heard from the direction of the bathroom, causing everyone to rush towards the sound. On arriving there, they sway Diddy and Justin standing over G, who was bleeding from his hip. Diddy later told everyone that the police were on their way and that they should inform them it was a robbery. When the police arrived, they went to the bathroom and cased the place, but somehow concluded that the whole incident was a robbery gone wrong. A few months later, the police produced three suspects, connected them to the shooting, and subsequently incarcerated them. That, according to Rodney Jones, was how Diddy and Fahim made that particular case go away without much furor. Aside from having links in law enforcement, Diddy allegedly pays off witnesses to his crime and forces them to sign NDAs. When the footage of Diddy laying his hands on Cassie started going rounds on the internet, y'all be asking why the hotel security and staff didn't report Diddy, right? Well, it turns out Diddy may have paid them hush money. According to Gene Deal, the former bodyguard of Diddy, he suspects Diddy gave them some money to shut them up and for the footage. However, it isn't clear how CNN got their hands on the video when it sure was in Diddy's custody. So, with these allegations at the back of our fans' minds, it's easy to see why many would argue Diddy has tunnels that link to his home. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.